All right, good morning. Glad to see that all the hangovers are here and ready to go. Um, so I got the first few slides, so I'm going to start my timer. I got me five minutes. So um, I'm going to give a little background on the project that we have. Uh, da -da -da -da. Come on, go, next one, next one. There we go. Um, so first thing is, I'm from Clark County, so where in the heck is Clark County? The Clark County is down in the southwest corner of Washington State. Um, it is part of the Portland metropolitan area. Um, it's basically bounded by the Columbia River on the south and the west and the Lewis River on the north. And then, uh, so kind of who we are, it's a pretty good sized county, population about half a million. Um, it's fifth most in uh, the third most in Portland Metro. Um, and there are seven different counties in the Portland metro area. Um, and the kind of, we're kind of a bedroom community. There's not a whole lot of industry um, in the county. And so basically a th third of our total commutes within the county go over one of the two bridges into the Portland metro area. So this is the project that we've been working on uh, apparently for like the last 15 years. Um, but it's finally supposedly going to get funded, sort of, kind of. Um, come this year and uh, so it's the corridor and it's basically from 11th Street over here all the way over to 50th on this side um, is it going click right there this one oops that one yep is there pointer uh, that was already set up. I thought it was too okay there we go so from 11th all the way to 50th which is about a three mile corridor um, and then being next to the interchange, uh, there's a lot of commercial, um, and it's kind of a, it's a really much a joint project, uh, between us and the state, but there's also a lot of stakeholders. Um, you have this area right in here, this blue area that's very zoned, a lot of commercial and mixed use, and will be generating approximately a couple thousand trips in the PM peak. Um, and then we have another housing development over here, another one over here, and another one over here that are coming in right away. And um, the interchanges is kind of undersized, um, substandard, short ramps, stuff like that, very low. Um, and so they're going to rebuild it. Um, and the other thing that happened here was this, this is our urban growth boundary, um, this dark green line. And everything that has this kind of hatching on it was in urban holdings. And so the urban holdings being lifted. And so the thought is that in the next 15, 20 years that this is going to get kind of pounded as far as uh, trips. And currently this, there's a moratorium out there as far as development because all the trips at the interchange are all spoken for. Um, da -da -da -da. So here's kind of zooming in on the actual project um, that Randy and Amanda are going to be talking about. Um, so we have the a realignment of Delphel here because it actually comes in right here right now. Um, then we have the interchange area. We have a new roundabout going in here to access the development to the north and the south. Uh, we have a new road that's getting built through here with another roundabout up top. This frontage road gets disconnected as does this road down here. And with that, I'm a minute under my time. I consider that a win. <laughs> All right, thanks, Matt. So before Amanda goes through and starts talking about some of the project specifics and, and how we modeled the, the roundabouts, I wanted to talk a little bit about the types of roundabout analysis that we went through, as well as some tips and tricks for calibration. So if you're going to do modeling for roundabouts, you really have two choices in terms of tools. You have the deterministic tools and you have stochastic tools. The deterministic tools are going to be HCM methodology. That methodology is incorporated into Vistro. Uh, Sidra will also do the HCM methodology. And then Sidra also has their own, the um, Australian based methodology. And then Rodell is another software. It's a UK based empirical solution. Um, so you have a variety of different tools. Um, generally, we'll use these for initial concept development. So you can quickly go through, size the roundabout, how many lanes either by approach or the whole roundabout. And so you can quickly do an alternatives test without the time and expense of eSIM. Um, you'll also get some preliminary operation details. So V2 
BC ratios, level of service, um, calculation-based queuing. And of course, depending on which software selection and the methodology you use on those softwares, you may get different results. Um, different agencies have requirements. Others um, don't require to use a particular software. And then the other thing it's important to note is the limitations of these methodologies. So technically, the HCM methodology is limited to uh, no more than two lane roundabouts and up to four legs. So often when we're dealing with roundabouts, sometimes we're going outside that limitation. Um, and then we get to the stochastic model. So the stochastic is basically the simulation. So here we're looking at the detailed operations analysis. Um, and so here we're really trying to capture elements that you may not be able to capture fully in the deterministic model. So there's a lot of elements that some of the methods may not pick up on. Closely spaced intersections, adjacent signals. In the case of our project, we have a ramp meter for a freeway on-ramp immediately downstream of the roundabouts. We want to make sure that we're not spilling back into those roundabouts. So with this, we could really get a good handle on lane utilization, progression through the roundabouts, and any queuing. So ultimately, we're looking at driver behavior, speed, gap acceptance. These are all modeled with distributions. And then multimodal interactions. So any bike and ped interactions and the performance. So now in a couple um, tips on the calibration side. So there's a couple different factors that will impact the calibration or the capacity of your roundabout. Speed, of course, is one of those. Um, so our preferred method of setting up the speed um, in vSIM is right here at the entry radius, we'll use a reduced speed area. So the nice thing about using a reduced speed area is that the vehicles will automatically decelerate into the, the reduced speed area so that we don't have to worry about placing a desired speed decision at a particular point. So, and then immediately downstream of that, we place a desired speed decision of the circulating speed. So depending on the design, we'll figure out what the speed distribution needs before the roundabout. Then regardless of what path the vehicles take through the roundabout, they'll be at the correct circulating speed. And then we place a desired speed decision at the exit to have them return to the facility speed. So the nice thing about this approach is that when you start looking at three lane roundabouts, sp spiral left turns, the geometry can get kind of messy within the circle. And it was fairly common a lot of people will use reduced speed areas within the circle, but they don't always apply if vehicles are coming in in the middle of them. And so this method allows you to get the correct speeds without worrying about uh, what the geometry is in the, in the middle. So then the other part of, of calibration and getting the capacity right is gap acceptance. So assuming most of you in here are VSIM users, you probably know well what conflict areas and priority rules are. Just a quick recap. So a conflict area um, shown here is automatically going to define the, the conflict based on how you draw the geometry. So based on the overlapping links and connectors. The nice thing about a conflict area is that it automatically accounts for each vehicle's own acceleration profile. So you don't have to worry um, about setting up separate ones for cars versus trucks. Um, ultimately, that gives you more intelligent behavior. It's a lot faster setup. Um, but it's also important to note that the behavior is going to depend on how you draw that geometry. So in this example here on the left, you can see the connectors, the purple lines here. If you use really long sweeping connectors, you're going to end up with really large conflict areas. That's going to affect your capacity. Um, you may be able to offset that by lowering gap times. Whereas if you use shorter connectors, you're going to have a higher capacity. So you just have to be aware that how you draw your geometry will actually affect the operations in that sense. Now the priority rules, you manually place the, the stop bar or yield point. And then for each conflict, so for each lane, you set up a different conflict marker. And so the nice thing is it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you set it up, but it only uses a single gap time, which means cars versus trucks that have vastly different acceleration profiles often require that you set up duplicate sets of priority rules. So it's much more cumbersome to set up. So ultimately, the roundabout capacity is a function of the gap acceptance, the speed, the truck percentage, the driver behavior. 
So these are all the different little dials that you might adjust when calibrating the roundabout. But because we're dealing with a stochastic model with a very flexible network, I would bet if two people in this room, I gave you the exact same roundabout design and the exact same set of data inputs, we're going to get different results in the end just because there is so much flexibility in how you set it up. It's not that one model is wrong over the other. You just need to be very careful on the calibration to make sure it's set up properly. So how do you know it's calibrated? Um, there's a couple different methods of doing this. Our recommended method is that you check the capacity by each approach. So the capacity of a roundabout is measured according to the HCM as the entering volume versus the conflicting volume. So these are the capacity curves from the HCM. Um, and so you could test that in vSIM by creating a test model and you overload one approach at a time. So say you put 5,000 vehicles on that approach, you measure what gets through, and then that would be your, your entering volume relative to the conflicting volume. So ideally you're going to want to calibrate though to field conditions. But rarely are you working on a roundabout that's at capacity, or if it's a future roundabout, rarely is there a nearby roundabout that's at capacity that you get reliable data from. So if you don't have that, that's where maybe you would use the HCM as sort of a baseline to see, is your model in the right ballpark? Um, that being said, you don't necessarily want to calibrate to a deterministic model. So as we talked about before, there's a lot of different factors that those deterministic models may not pick up on. So you may justifiably be above this line or below this line, but this will allow, at least let you know where you stand with your particular model. So the other thing is um, what method you use. So you see the purple line here, this is HCM 2010. And then the blue line up here, that's the HCM 6. So just simply with that update, it went up about 225 vehicles per hour on the capacity. And some folks still even consider that to be a little on the conservative side. Um, WashDOT, as an agency, recommends that you use SIDRA. Their recommended parameters are a little on the aggressive side, so they're even less conservative. So for WashDOT, we're looking to be just over this line. So you can basically run through these test files, plot them up against these curves. You could test different conflicting flows, and you can see where your model is. Once you get it all dialed in, then you could go back and put in your project volumes. But by testing that capacity, I could see where I stand. And say I end up here um, way above the line somewhere. And I've peer-reviewed uh, several different models, and sometimes you do find one where a capacity is just through the roof. Either the gaps weren't right or the speeds were too high. And so if you, your model capacity is up here, and maybe your existing volumes are, are down here, and if your future forecast volumes are in this location and you have that capacity artificially high, you're going to show that the roundabout's going to be perfectly fine. When in reality, that future model would likely fail and the roundabout wouldn't, um, wouldn't actually be a good solution or maybe need to be bigger. Conversely, if you're down in this location, so if your capacity is artificially low, the consequence is you might show that a single lane should be a multi-lane, or you might say that a roundabout doesn't even work. So there's pretty big consequences for not getting the capacity dialed in. So just because it's, say in our case here, it's a future corridor, it's all future forecast volumes, we still need to go through this calibration process. And so whether it's Clark County or WashDOT reviewing this, we know we have a solid foundation for um, um, the models and the results that we're producing. And the unique thing about this project is this is one of the few projects where we didn't even bother doing an existing conditions calibration just because it's a single or two lane road, it's all two way stop controlled intersections. We could certainly build that and calibrate it. But as Matt said, we're adding thousands of trips in here and we're changing the control type at every single intersection. So there's really not a valid comparison there. So I'll hand it off to Amanda to talk about the challenges. Thank you. OK, so when actually modeling this corridor, we ran into a couple of challenges, which I'm going to address in the next couple of slides. Uh, the first issue was the volumes themselves. 
As Matt and Randy mentioned, the development is forecasted to be um, high in the future, and so we have future volumes that are nearing capacity. In the chart on the right, you can see our forecast volumes in black just below the capacity line, and then the equivalent calibrated model approaches we have here. So we were really working on a fine line between being right at the capacity line and our forecast volumes very close to being over capacity. The next challenge had to do with lane utilization and routing. Because roundabouts don't do well with heavy left turns, we had the issue of conflicting southbound left coming off the off-ramp with people coming from the west, so either northbound left turns or westbound left. So some of these, like the westbound left or the southbound left, are from commuters, but then the northbound left would come from event traffic. There's an amphitheater to the southwest of this interchange, so that leads to this conflicting blue movement right here. And since the left turns need to spiral out and be in the correct lane before they approach the second uh, roundabout in the interchange, we have a lane utilization issue where we need three lanes on this approach so that the westbound left turners can be in the left two lanes and the northbound left turners from this interchange can be in the outer lanes to go through. So this is what led us to looking at a three lane roundabout interchange. In addition to this, the other factors you have to look at are um, spiraling out your left turns so that they're accurately portrayed in the model and can exit the roundabout, don't get stuck in a middle lane when you have multiple lanes. And then we also utilized doing no lane change zones in the interchange. So the cars need to be in the correct position before they go through the roundabout and not allowing any lane changes to increase the friction in this roundabout that's already gonna be very close to capacity. The third challenge ended up not being too much of a challenge thanks to the method we used that Randy went over for speed control. So as you mentioned before, we used the reduced speed area as you approach the curvature of the roundabout. Then we have a circulating speed of about 24 to 29 miles per hour going through the roundabout. And then once you exit the roundabout, we go back to the posted speed. So this part wasn't much of an issue but it was important to have it properly calibrated for our conditions. And then the fourth challenge, which was probably the most challenging of all, was getting the correct gap acceptance at these five different roundabouts. And we did a lot of tests to make sure that we were close to our capacity curve. So on the left-hand side in this first example, this is the southbound off-ramp and on-ramp. And you can see at first when we have starting out with conflict areas. There's a very large conflict area that's marked by this um, geometry. The connectors are on the long side and there's more conflict area as they cross over for a three lane roundabout. And initially, you can see in red, we started out below this line. And since our volumes are already so close, we can't afford to lose any capacity here. And even when you dial down the um, gap acceptance rates as small as you can with conflict areas, it wasn't good enough to get us to the capacity line. So we had to switch to using the priority rule setup here for the southbound approach on this roundabout. And that's when we start moving up to the line. So this blue circle here indicating what we were finally able to achieve by switching to priority rules. And then we had to do a similar process on a couple of the other roundabouts, including the county roundabout at 15th. Here, it was the northbound leg that had high capacity needs due to the volume. So we have a northbound right turn slip lane. And in addition, we had to use the priority rule to calibrate the capacity for this approach. One thing to note is that even though you don't have to do all or nothing, you can mix and match what you're using. You should only mix and match by approach. So you shouldn't have conflict areas and priority rules on the same approach. But in the case of these two roundabouts, we were used to 
able to use conflict areas on the other single lane approaches or smaller approaches that didn't have problems with gap acceptance. So that made it easy to start out with the easy route of using conflict areas when we could, but then switching to priority rules when there was no other way to achieve that capacity that we desperately needed. So once we addressed all of challenges, where does that leave us? The key takeaway is that this model is being used to support a pretty high level of investment in this area. So it was important that we made the right decision. It could be the difference between a two lane or a three lane <coughs> roundabout concept. And it's the difference between building these roundabouts at the interchange or another option. Especially when it comes to roundabouts, we don't want to overbuild. So in the case where we don't need multiple lanes or a slip lane until the future, we want to make sure we know the proper capacity at these roundabouts. And one other unusual thing is that when we're forecasting the volumes for this interchange, the development trips that are already approved are exceeding what our normal forecast would say from the travel demand model. So we actually had to go back and adjust the volumes, make sure we were being conservative and allowing for all that development to come in and what that potential would look like. So this led to having some heavy left bound, left turn volumes, like it says right there, the 500 conflicting with almost 1,700 westbound vehicles. That's really pushing the capacity of what we can get, even with a fully calibrated three lane roundabout. So because of this, we are also exploring alternate interchange concepts um, one of the issues, as mentioned before, is that there's a ramp meter for these uh, on-ramp approaches, and we didn't want that backing into the roundabouts in addition to the capacity issue. So we are looking at modeling a diverging diamond interchange and have also considered a spooey or even going to metered roundabouts so that we could flush all that southbound left turning volume and they can actually have a chance to find gaps because once you go to a three lane it also makes it harder for those cars to find a gap across three lanes um yep so that's where we're at right now any questions how did you determine the desired speed within the round um i think we started out with the standard that it should be about 25 miles per hour. I think we did push on the higher side of that because it's already a high speed corridor and we're assuming that the drivers will be confident going through these roundabouts once they're fully built, but was it's a little trial and error. Yeah, was it like an iterative, iterative approach then? Yeah, I definitely tried increasing the volume a little bit when we were having trouble with the gap acceptance before we switched over to priority rules, but um, I don't know, Rand, if you want to speak to it, but it's often better to keep the speeds in the roundabout at a reasonable rate, right? To get the safety benefits, we don't want them going through at 30 miles an hour. And NCHRP 672 provides some guidance on speeds within the roundabout. Ultimately, if you have a design, you should be modeling whatever the speed of that design is. Sometimes it's iterative because you get a speed out of the design, you model it, and maybe it's too high or too low, and then you might need to revise the design. So it's it's not always a clear cut, but generally you want to be in the mid 40s for your circulating speed. Yes? What is the gap acceptance that y'all kind of landed on? I assume you came to it the same way, the iterative method to figure out what that minimum gap of seconds would be for your priority rules. Right. Yeah, so for the priority rules, the, the VSIM help actually is a good example of like how to set those up, especially when you're doing the multiple lanes, because you need all those conflict markers. Um, it varies between, I think, like one to three seconds, depending on for the trucks or for the cars and if it was an inner lane or outer lane. But basically, I just set it up with the example and then changed it to move that dot closer to the capacity line until we got a lot closer. So, and then watching to make sure that there were no simulation issues, no cars crashing, but yeah, it was an iterative process. And on gap acceptance calibration, that's always the hard part, because sometimes people actually have gap acceptance data from the field, but then making sure that that data applies to the model, because like exactly where you place all those conflict markers, and the, especially the way that the, the VSIM guidebook will actually separate out the headway and the, the incoming gap as separate conflict markers, 
So there's so much variation on how that sets it up, and it's sometimes hard to figure out, are you actually measuring the same gap in the priority rule versus what you had in the field? And so that's where, all right, well, somebody might disagree with a little bit of how you did that, but if your capacity is dialed in and you can prove that you have the right capacity, it kind of throws that argument out the window. And in, in the county, we only have three roundabouts in, in the entire county, and only one county facility has a roundabout. So there's not a whole lot of data, um, and they're not the most popular in my <laughs> jurisdiction. <laughs> so yeah, people like their regular inter regular signalized inter intersections. Should they like the three lane one? Then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the, we put that out there as a as an option, and then looked at the faces in the room, and you could tell it wasn't going to go. The EDI works great, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I, I think that's probably going to end up probably where we're going to end up, especially with, um, you know, from my standpoint as with the jurisdiction is that we do have that amphitheater, so you could dump an extra three to 5,000 vehicles in 45 minutes, and how do you get them through three roundabouts into the amphitheater facility for the DDI, you know, they just come off, they go in, and flush it right out, yeah. right? That's probably where it's going to end up, and there's another one being built. Um, just south of Seattle right now. So at least we have, we won't be the first one in the state. You know, we have, we're like, oh, you guys did it here. Why not do it at our interchange? So we have that. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised they don't like roundabouts if they'd like a DDI. Um, we'll see how, when we did the open house, it was just the, my last slide where it just blob, and we said, we're looking at alternatives. I don't think you actually got out there yet that it's gonna be a DDI. Um, but like I said, at least we have the one that it should be opening, I think it opens in a couple months. Um, so we can they say that, you know, hey, if you have any questions, you know, drive up there, go to Cabela's, enjoy your day, and go through the, their new DDI. Yeah, and that makes more sense from an event management standpoint. Oh, totally. Yeah. Roundabouts are what they are, you can't really do anything. Yeah, and, like and the thought of having to get, you know, six, maybe eight officers out there to control these roundabouts, you know, for before and after, where now if we do get a DDI, it's signal timing and you're done. You know, you probably don't even need to do any coning. You just come right out on and off, so. Yes? Above the Clark County logo and below Matt's email, it looks like you <laughs> have detectors in this model. What were those controlling? Hold on, let me go back to it. Those are you mean parking lots, so we use DTA. Oh, that's right, right to here. Put, to do origin destination routing, to assign the matrix in there. So those are parking lots to basically zones to do DTA routing. You're not supposed to pay attention to those details. <laughs> <laughs> I know, good <laughs> eye. <laughs> we could do a whole other presentation on uh, DTA and volume development. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs>